Well, let's stand together. Let's stand together. It's time to go uh, go to the Lord in prayer and also into worship. We're going to have a wonderful day. Let me give you a few things that we will be doing this morning. Uh, in just a few moments after this first song, I'm going to come back up and we're going to do a back to school prayer. Also have a special prayer need that I want to mention to you and we'll pray over that need as well this morning. Also a, uh, a one more special announcement. So we'll do that on the other side of this first song. So let me open to us with prayer. Uh, let me say to those watching on live stream, thank you for joining us. This is the day of the Lord. We've come here to worship him. Let me pray. Lord, we give you this time. We give you this place. We give you this setting. All that we are, all that we desire to be belongs to you. So Lord, we come passionately into your presence, ready to worship you and to give you honor. We thank you for this day, the day of the Lord. And all of us wonderful people said amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
Let's give the Lord praise today. Can we do that? We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You know, I, I was uh, talking to the first crowd this morning, and just indulge me, let's remain standing together for a few moments. Um, I was talking to the first crowd this morning about that song, and it talks about, I'll follow you anywhere. And uh, I, I think when it says, I'll follow you anywhere, if that's like a spooky closet in the house, we'll feel good about that. But have you ever been in danger, and he's asked you to go there? I think that would be a different story, where you really faced, where you really could be faced with imprisonment for the gospel, or you could face harm and foul done to your body because of sharing the gospel. I think, uh, I th- I think that song, Christian Stanfield wrote that song, I think out of Passion City Church out of Atlanta. But uh, I-, I think that has that connotation to it. It has a deeper meaning than, Lord, wherever I go, maybe it's a surgery I don't want to have. He will, he will lead you and he will be with you. Well, good morning. And uh, this is a big week for us in Macon County and surrounding counties. It's back to school. Hooray, right? Well, I heard some, some mixed reviews, mixed reviews, mixed reviews. Um, I want us to pray. I want us to open with prayer for our school system, the staff, not only in our county, but neighboring counties, that, uh, that uh, everyone would be safe and that they would go back. And uh, I know we're going back differently, but we would go back safely. So let me pray. Lord. I want to thank you for the staff and the team of amazing teachers and educators we have in this county. But not only in this uh, county, but also in our neighboring county and our private schools at uh, Raven Gap and uh, other areas, Lord. I know people come from all over and people are watching from all over. So we pray a hedge of protection over our children and over the teachers and educators. We pray that viruses and sickness would stay far away from us and that you would build a hedge of protection around us. Lord, angels are encamped about those who believe, and we believe, we believe in you. So would you protect our teachers and educators? Would you be with them during this, during this difficult time? And Lord, for the, for the kids, for the kids that are walking in, com- in, in a completely different environment and setting, I pray for them. I know that there's going to be different protocols, different ordinances, and we pray for them. And we ask for your blessings to be upon them. We ask for your protection. And I pray that it would be a great year of learning. We thank you for this in the name of the Lord. And everybody said amen. You know, I was thinking in the early service, growing up, I remember watching television shows that the church house would often be the schoolhouse. And the schoolhouse would often be the church house. And so learning is a joy. When we learn and we grow, Jesus Christ, while he was on earth, grew in stature and in wisdom and in knowledge. I don't want the gift of knowledge and the gift of learning to be taken away from our kids. It's a beautiful gift. So let's pray for them and let's pray that they're protected. Also, let me say congratulations. Uh, we did this uh, uh, this morning to the early crowd, but l- let, me, let me do it here as well. Um, to the arrival of Miss Welker Breeze Brooks. This is uh, the daughter of Josh and Becca. Was born Tuesday, 8-11-20, um, 8 11 20, 8 August 11, 2020. So that would have been Tuesday morning, very, very early. So in case Becca's watching, I'm glad you are well. I'm glad she is with us. And mama and baby are healthy. And the church gives them a hand of appreciation and acknowledgement there. Yes. <clears throat> One more announcement, and then we're going to continue to worship the Lord and uh, just have a wonderful time expressing our heart's cry to our King. Um, Abe Billingsley is a young man. This is Jessica Cantrell, Josh, their, their son, uh, Jessica's son. Abe is headed to basic training in Texas. And uh, this is also the grandson of Terry and Debbie Moffat. So... Um, They are supposed to be en route, I think, tonight, this evening. So Jessica, I talked to her before service. We were texting back and forth. And uh, she said, it's overwhelming. You know, it's exciting, yet like your heart is being ripped out. So here was my prayer for Abe, that not only would he be surrounded by some great military leaders, but there would be godly examples around him. And that there would be men of character, women of character, men of great wisdom, Uh, but also people of faith, spirit-filled Christians that would continue to culture his growth as a young man. 
So I think it would do, uh, do this family well, Terry and Debbie and Jessica and the, this whole gang and Josh and the siblings to know that their church family is praying for them. So Lord, we lift Abe up today as he goes to basic training. And we pray that he would know that he has a, a church home here at Prentice that loves him and that is concerned, but yet so excited that he has chosen a good thing. I pray that you would bless him and keep a watchful eye over his life. Now, Lord, I pray for, I pray for mom. I pray for her especially that you would guard her heart. I know that the emotions are many. And I pray for the siblings and I, I, I just, I pray for them, God. And I, I pray for Terry and Debbie. Just pray for the whole bunch of them that you would be with them during this time. It's a wonderful time, but it's also an emotional time. So Father, to all of our children that are going off to college during uncertain times, challenges, we pray for them. And we ask for your blessings to not only be upon the student, but also the parent who is sending. Guard them and guide them, I pray, in the name of the Lord. And everybody said amen. Hey, we're going to continue to worship the Lord. Once again, I acknowledge those that are watching online. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you. I hope you're keeping up with one another, chatting on our chat line. I'm going to turn the service over to Samuel and this gang behind me. Let's worship the Lord together. Would you acknowledge the presence of somebody around you? Maybe saying hello.
Well, let's celebrate that fact today. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen and amen. Come on, just in your own way, can you express thanksgiving to Him? Lord, we are so thankful that You are the name that is above every name. 
And Lord, that you have given us the means to salvation, grace through faith in the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for anyone today that has not appropriated that truth in their life. For the person today that doesn't know you as King and the Lord of their life, I pray for them today. And I pray by the close of this service that they will make things right with God through the person of Jesus. I pray for those that are watching today that they'll be encouraged, they'll be challenged, and together through the teaching of God's Word that, we'll be, that we will all be strengthened. And that when we leave here, we can say, you know what, I feel encouraged today. And I'm glad I went. I'm glad I went. So Lord, I pray for this time together. I pray for this occasion. I pray for all the needs of this house. We give you thanks. And everyone said amen. Amen and amen. God bless you as you're seated. Uh, Thank you musicians so much. I appreciate uh, your commitment to excellence and your commitment to being here. And appreciate all of those that are watching once again. uh, Hello to all of you. If you have your Bibles uh, or your media device... Um, Go with me to Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, and uh, we'll begin to acknowledge verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and let's go 6 and 7 as well. So we have been in a series of messages on the subject of heaven, and I think we all want to go there, but I think we would want to as long as we are in that place that we can carry out function and responsibility here on earth. I think we would like to delay our appointment there. Um, I I think most of us feel that way. Um, We want to go, but maybe not yet. Um, So so the study of heaven is something interesting. Now look, let me say that there's going to be a lot of things that I have covered in the previous two weeks that I'm not going to cover today. Uh, Remember a couple of things that I did share Remember, we, we often sing about going up to heaven. We are going to go up, but we are going to come back down. Every, everyone has got to realize that truth, that there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth built here. We're going to remain in heaven for a short time, and then we're going to come back down here on earth. So I've wrestled with what I wanted to talk to you about heaven because there's so much depth. And I, and I think I shared with you either last week or the week before, you can devote your whole life to the study of eschatology, the study of the end times, and you will still come up wanting more and more and more because you will come up futile with your efforts. You, you just won't know all there is to know. Uh, so I will do my best by giving you uh, what I know and what I, have, uh, what, what I bring to you today. Um, one thing that I shared with you last week, and I was in conflict all morning, Because I want to continue, I was prepared to come into this day to talk to you about um, several things that you will find in heaven. And I shared with you last week, heaven, you're going to have an incredible home, and God has been preparing this place for you for 2,000 years. So I talked about the home that God has prepared for you, and that He's custom building you a house. Today, I wanted to talk about heaven is going to have some great food. And uh, not about gluttony. I don't want you to think of in terms of gluttony. I can't wait to get to heaven and enjoy all the banana pita. No, 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 no. About the fellowship and the friendships and the togetherness. Eating and the joys of that is so much more than the substance and the carbohydrates that we fill up on. It's about the atmosphere of the togetherness. Can I hear amen? And maybe the carbohydrates don't hurt a little bit. All right, so uh, here here we go. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the food in heaven, and then I also wanted to talk to you about the city of heaven. Because remember, John saw a country township falling down from heaven. No, John saw a what coming down? A city, a city coming down from heaven. So I wanted to talk to you about that heaven was going to have a home feel, but it was going to be very metropolis. And I've got a lot of information about that because a lot of people just don't like the city. I don't like a city. I don't like anything about a city, but I want to talk to you about what you don't like about the city because the things that you don't like about the city are typically the crime and the hatred and uh, the busyness. Well, in heaven, there won't be any crime. So we've got some good answers there. Then I started early this morning when I got up, I had listened to a, um, a pastor from Arizona speak on a few things regarding heaven, and I completely shifted. So maybe if, if there's a few moments left over, I'll cover two and three about the things you'll find in heaven, about good food in a good city. If not, we'll catch it next week, because really all we have to do until he comes again is study God's word and worship together. 
So we got plenty of time unless he chooses to come back. Five reasons heaven won't be boring. Let me give you a quote. There's a science fiction writer by, uh, by the name of Isaac As- Asimov, and he wrote, he wrote this, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even far worse. Did you know that some people have gathered and assembled in their mind that heaven is going to be a place of boredom? Some people have, have you know, there's two, two, typically, uh, two typical thoughts regarding heaven and the everlasting life is this. And, and I've used these many times. Chubby cherubims with wings that have eaten way too much bread. Or there's going to be nothing to do. There's going to be nothing to do but like, a, but, but, but like an extremely long Sunday morning worship service that will never end. And heaven is so much deeper and so much wider and so much more expansive than those two aforementioned. So I want to give you some practical things, hopefully five, five reasons why I don't believe heaven is going to be boring. All right? So let's get started with that, and I hope that you will hear something that will cause you to go, hmm, and scratch your head, and maybe some things, yes, I agree with that, but I didn't know why I agreed with that, and hopefully I can give you some things that we can settle, settle it in your heart. Let me give you a few words to describe hell. Once again, just a few words, and I'm not, this is not a complete list, so I'm going to leave out a whole lot. But here we go. Hell, isolation, pain, boredom. Loneliness, death. Okay, those were a few things when I think of hell. When I think of heaven and the summary of scriptures, here's what I think of relationships, pleasure, adventure, Jesus. Those are a few things that I think of. Once again, this is not a few, uh, this is not a, a complete list on either side. There's a story of a young boy, I think, I, I, or a young man, I think he was 27 years of age, and uh, I, I believe it happened in Georgia, but I stand to be corrected, and there was a terrible bus accident. There was a terrible bus accident where a school bus was, I, I guess it was rear-ended by a truck, and uh, has anybody seen the pictures of that accident? Anybody seen the pictures? It was, it was terrible. It was a terrible accident, and so the young man, 27 years of age, uh, hit the back of this bus, and Upon hitting and making collision, uh, he jumped out of his truck, he entered into the back of the bus, he ripped uh, bus seats off of the young children, and he got the young children out of the back of the bus and brought them to safety, and then he died. And the reason he was able to do all of that while he was in the middle or in the process of dying was something called adrenaline. Do you know who gave you adrenaline? Adrenaline. God did. Do you know who gave you uh, the, these moments of great exhilaration and excitement? God did. God did. And though darkness has come in and invaded our soil because our first parents blew it in the Garden of Eden, and we have seen so much wickedness and trauma and tragedy, now we feel like this place is a place of gloom and despair, but that wasn't the original intent, and that's certainly not going to be the intent of heaven Heaven is not going to be a place of uh, uh, being a chore or a bore. It's going to be a place of laughter and joy and great excitement as we are with people we love, we are with the people we love, and the God we serve for all of eternity. So I want to give you five reasons why I think heaven will not be born. And as I said, I followed this after a guide that, uh, that that I heard some of this from just a day or two ago, and then this morning my heart was prodded to go this direction. Number one. In heaven, you will laugh. In heaven, in fact, many people will laugh for the very first time. (laughs) You will laugh for the very, very first time when you get to heaven. Some will laugh because, can't believe I made it. No, hopefully not. People will laugh when you get to heaven. Let me give you a few scriptures. Uh, let Let me make a statement first, and then we'll give you a few scriptures. Don't equate religious people in heaven. Don't, re- d- d- don't relate sour, long-faced, I don't like my life, I don't, like en- uh, I don't enjoy what I do as heaven. That is not heaven. That is not heaven at all. When I think of quarantine, I mentioned this earlier, I think of, I think of hell. 
being away from people, being away from people I love, being away from the church that I want to attend with and worship with. That's what I think of. You will laugh in heaven. Psalm 2 and 4. He who sits in heaven laughs. It's a good one. Here's another one. Psalm 37 and 13. The Lord laughs. Psalm 59 and 8. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. And you can read those scriptures and put them in full context. There's a dynamic of Jesus in his ministry that many of us haven't comprehended. And that it was that Jesus, while he was on earth, even had a sense of humor. Yes, Jesus had a sense of humor. In in Ecclesiastes, I love this, there's a time for everything, right? Chapter 3, verse 1, 4, there's a time for everything. There is a time to sleep, time to die, time to eat, time to celebrate, time. There's a time to laugh. A time to laugh. Um, Your sense of humor today is incredible practice for heaven tomorrow. There was a writing by the name of, uh, there was a writing by, um, by a guy by the name of Elton Trueblood, and he writes on the humor of Christ. He says there's 30 texts that speaks of the humor of Jesus Christ. This stuff is way over my head, but let me give you a few of them. Let me give you a few of them. He says Christ laughed, and he would often expect others around him to laugh. Unfortunately, a misguided piety has made us fear that acceptance of this obvious wit in humor would somehow be mildly blasphemous. Meaning that if we had joy or we laugh or we are lighthearted. L- l- let me tell you what, I have, uh, what happened and then I'll give you two, uh, two quick verses which I think embody the humor of Jesus Christ. I think what has happened is because we have only seen the dark, the ugly of comedy that we have deemed that all comedy is of the enemy. And so therefore, when we laugh, we're more like our, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're more like our father Satan than we would be like our father God. And there's nothing more f- further from the truth. Um, Angela, I, d- I don't know if Kyle told you this story, but um, we were making... Uh, tacos and burritos at the house. And many of you know that Angela's mom is in the hospital. She's very, very sick. She had come up to, uh, uh, to she, Angela brought her to Franklin because it is back to school time. Angela's a speech pathologist across the street and it was time for Angela to go back to work and her mom uh, needed someone. So she wanted to bring her back here and uh, she just really had a bad, bad evening, Wednesday evening, and she's been admitted since Thursday and uh, got multiple things going on. And uh, so, so you can pray for her. Um, you can pray for her. And so I told Angela, I said, look, you, you, uh, you do what you need to do. You take care of mom and I've got the boys. And um, so, so we, we fixed uh, tacos, and, uh, which is not uncommon. We eat them probably four days a week. Um, and uh, we fixed, uh, hey, it's fairly easy. Brown some meat, put some taco seasoning, grab a tortilla, and then you're done, right? Right? It's easy. It's easy. And so, but we're pretty creative. We do some things, and we, we like to have fun with uh, Mexican food around our house. Love it. Uh, it's kind of our beans and tater. Um, and, and so, we get these tacos, and I said, look, I, I, guys, eat all you want, but save mom some of the steak, because we have steak tacos, and uh, we had beef tacos. And uh, my boys aren't dumb. They'd rather have a steak than they would uh, ground beef. And so they both fixed them steak tacos. <coughs> and uh, Kyle did not want any ground beef at all. So he said, well, I'm going to fix me one more steak burrito. I said, well, just save your mom some. And so he went over there and he put one piece of steak. And I had shaved it pretty thin, marinated it, and it was pretty thin. So about that size, about the size of my pinky, maybe. And he put it on a big giant shell. Wrapped it up with cheese, and he doesn't, he's not an herbivore, he's a carnivore like his brother Cade, and they don't like, you know, lettuce and tomato and pico de gallo and cilantro and all of that good stuff on it, so it's just meat and cheese and a little bit of sauce, and he rolls this thing up, and when he's done wrapping it up, I kid you not, it's the size of my pinky. So if you could imagine a white flour tortilla clothing one piece of steak, and so he picks this up, and it's this long. And he gets tickled at the table and just starts laughing so hard. And he's like, oh, I got to take a picture. I got to show mama my burrito. Because it was really that long. Was there anything evil about that laughter? Was there anything wrong about that laughter? Was there anything wicked about that laughter? But no, what what has happened in the church world, and growing up Wesleyan holiness, 
um, which, which, which we were, Wesley and Holiness, uh, believing that we should have a right standing before God, that we should live to uh, please God with a pure life, live a sanctified life. We often deemed humor, humor as being disrespectful. And unfortunately, that's so, so wrong. Because good humor comes from our Father God. It comes from, our hev- it comes from the heavens. God has given your family moments to laugh and to have joy for a purpose because the Bible says it's as good as what? Medicine. But what we see many times is people in a drunken stupor doing idiotic, foolish things and therefore we deem that as comedic and comedic is then wrong. But let's not throw it all out. Comedy is good and it can be pleasing unto the Lord. There's a couple of stories in your Bible, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into them, but theologians would deem two texts that Jesus used, I believe there's a total of 30, but two of the texts that Jesus used, the the people that were listening, the audience that day would have deemed them as somewhat, oh Jesus, you're being funny. When he talked about the plank and the speck, they would have taken that on the lighthearted when he said about the camel and the needle. These are humorous teachings that Jesus would have brought. Your sense of humor today is practice for heaven tomorrow. Remember what Luke 6 and 21 says. Pastor, how do you know there's going to be that laughter in heaven? Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. You shall rejoice in that day and leap for joy, and for behold, your reward is great in heaven. The word joy is mentioned 200 times. The word laugh is mentioned 40 times. Martin Luther, the great teacher, the great theologian, he said this, If you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. You will be able to laugh in heaven. A boring Christian is a bad advertisement for heaven. A boring Christian, a dull Christian, should you be sober? Should you be vigilant? Should you be alert? Yes. Should you be foolish? No. Can you laugh and have a good time in a good godly manner? Yes, and you should. Smile. Enjoy, enjoy. God put you on this earth for a purpose and a reason, and it wasn't to be sour and to grow sour fruit. Be joyful. So in heaven, you will laugh. In heaven, you will work and you will worship with divine beings. Interesting. In heaven, you will work and you will worship with divine beings. Look with me in Revelation 4. John is going to get a glimpse. Revelation 4, 1 through 8. I will get to Revelation 21, hopefully before the end. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before to me, like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit. And I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. The 24 thrones surrounded him. And 24 elders sat on them. And they were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. In front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like a sea. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes. Listen to this. In the center and around the throne were four living creatures, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third, was like a, uh, the third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out, day after day, night after night. They kept on saying, holy, holy is the Lord. And I'll stop there. In heaven, the second thing, the reason I know that it will not be born, is you will work and you will worship with divine beings in heaven. Now, I just gave you a, a, a beautiful example, a beautiful glimpse of what John saw in Revelation chapter 4. Now, the, I'm not the apocalyptic writer that Mark Goodwin is. He's in the house today, and he's the writer of apocalyptic stuff. But here's, here's what I do know, Mark. I do know in heaven that there's going to be God's human family, and then there's going to be God's divine family. There's going to be humanity, 
people like you and I, the saints of old, and then there's going to be these uh, created angelic hosts that, to be honest with you, it looks a little, sounds a little alienist kind of like. I mean, some of it is above my pay grade when I begin to comprehend and trying to read and to understand what they're going to be like. In heaven, human family and divine family. And we will work and we will worship together. Many people, when they think about working and learning in heaven, they think, wait, wait a second, pastor. I said I wanted to go to heaven Learning is torture to me. No, 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 no. Learning's a joy for you, my friend. That's why I said, what a disadvantage some of our children are at when they're not able to go and learn and to learn and to grow. Educating is wonderful. Some of you do great with book education, with formal education. Some of you do wonderful with informal, informal education. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be any learning disabilities. There's not going to be any sicknesses that's going to inhibit us from learning and growing. And so I want you to think about this for a moment. Remember I told you that learning about heaven and discovering heaven, you're going to have to have a childlike faith. You're going to have to behold the scriptures with childlike faith. You will work and worship with divine beings in heaven. We do not learn. We do not grow. We do not mature. Because we are falling, but because we are human. This is beautiful to me because when I get to heaven, I get to continue the pursuit of knowledge and learning. I'll talk about that a little bit more because some people feel that when you go to heaven, wait a second, Pastor, I'm perfect, therefore I know it all. No one ever told you when you go to heaven, you become all-knowing. Who's the all-knowing one in heaven? Anybody know? Omniscient God. He will still be worshipped by you because He will still be God. You will not be replacing God because of your perfection when you get to heaven. Hey God, now that I'm here and I'm perfect, why don't you get off of your throne? It's not happening that way. It's not happening that way at all. You will work and worship with divine beings. As I study Scripture and as I read Scripture, there are some amazing creatures a part of that divine heavenly community that have been created that worships God even today. Hmm. Human and divine family were together in Eden. And the human and the divine family will worship God when we come to earth again. Uh, in, a, in our family, who, who, here is, um, who here is an admirer of, a, an admirer of animals at a zoo? Like if you, had a, if, if you could go to a zoo or a ball game, how many would pick a zoo? Yeah, there's quite a few of you. Angela, raise your hand. You would pick a zoo all day long. Her and Cade, you and Cade, will. there's these little papers that are like outside the animal. And Angela and Cade will just read all about the animal. Wow, did you know that this one could do this and this one could do that? And me and Kyle's over there going, oh my gosh. There's like a thousand animals. There's a thousand writings about a thousand different animals. We've got to go. We've got to go. They like this. If you enjoy observing the beautiful creations that God had given, go to heaven. You're going to see some wonderful created stuff. And you're going to get to explore because you're going to have a body that will permit you to explore it. Let me give you a third one. Uh, You will work and worship with divine beings. You will laugh in heaven. You have lots to learn and lots to do and lots to explore. There is a lie that's been told many times that there is nothing to learn, nowhere to go when you get to heaven. Perfection is not completion. Let me say that again. Perfection is not completion. In the Garden of Eden, I'll, I'll, I'll save you time and not read the scripture, but Genesis 1 and 28, Genesis 2, 15 and 16. In the Garden of Eden, Adam pre-fall was what? Morally perfect. Was he? Before the fall, he was. It was. God, till, God told him to subdue the land, take care of the land, explore the land. Jesus, Jesus, when he came to earth, born perfect, sinless, righteous. Uh, in Luke chapter 2 and 40, the Bible says, and the child grew. The child grew and he became strong. And he was filled with wisdom. 
in Luke 2 and 52, the Bible says, this is, this is the important word, Jesus would increase in wisdom. Adam and Eve were perfect in the Garden of Eden. Adam was perfect until the fall. Jesus, while on earth, was perfect, yet he grew in what? Knowledge. He learned. I've got good news for you today. I've got good news for you. When you go to heaven, you're going to explore, observe. In, in, in fact, there's going to be someone who is quite familiar with all of the creation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And they may say, hey, can I show you something? I want to show you something I created. Look over there. Wow. 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 You're going to learn. You're going to learn And you're going to have this. All right. We do not learn, grow, mature, and explore because we are fallen, but we do because we're human. We do not learn, grow, and mature, and explore because we are fallen. But we do these things because we are human. The curse, remember what I shared with you. The curse is not, I go to work. The curse is, I go to work among thistles and thorns. Many of you, the moment... The corona hit, and you had to quit work and were one of the most miserable people on planet Earth. I mean, you were just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I, 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 why? Why? Because there is something innate in you that longs to do and to work and to be. This is who God made you to be. This is who God made you to be. He made in provisions for you to be a healthy version and to give you one day off a week, in our, in our culture, we pretty much set aside two days. It's called the weekend. But he's placed inside of you a desire to work. And when you can't, listen to me. There is something wrong with someone who can sleep till three and never work. There isn't anything wrong with a person who gets up and says, what can I accomplish today? There isn't. Now, of course, we know that some people have, I'll put under issues, and they require more sleep than others of us. Um, sleep is a good thing, but work is a good thing. Work is a very, very good thing. And when you get to heaven, you're going to have the joy. What kind of jobs are going to be in heaven? Oh, this is great. I don't think I'll, I'll be out of work, maybe, because everybody will be saved, so I don't need to preach anymore. Uh, I don't know, uh, Harold and Jamie, I don't know what y'all will do about real estate because God's going to have all these, home, I, I don't know what that looks like. If there's any other real estate agents, uh, Crabtree, Steve back there. I, I don't know. I don't know what that works like. Hamburgers, maybe. Maybe we can keep Moto open. I, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kind of jobs. I do believe electricians I, I, because we're going we're gonna to rebuild and we're going to have some con- construction and there's going to be some aspects of this new heaven and new earth that we're going to explore and it's going to be great. I don't think we'll need, uh, of course we won't need physicians, so all of that's going to be something we'll yet to see. We do not learn, grow, mature, and explore because we're fallen but because we're human. Number two, a perfect human being is still a human being. A perfect human being is still a human being. What do you mean by that? You're not God. When you get to heaven, there will still be a God to be revered, loved, and worshipped. Amen? What a joy it is to know that. Number three, there's a difference between learning through experience and sin. So you will learn in heaven, but it won't be one of those stories with, hey, hey, son, let me tell you, don't do that. Why, Dad? Can't tell you why, but I know, don't do that. How does dad know? From experience of sinning, and he fell forward. Didn't fall backwards. He now knows not what to do. That won't happen in heaven. Just because you are perfect does not mean you are done. You will be perfect and learn, do and explore forever. Revelation 5 and 10 says, You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. All right, number four. You will. Reasons you won't be bored in heaven. Give you two more. You will be with God in heaven. If you have your Bibles, Revelation 21 paints a beautiful picture. Let me, let me, let me give you two before, before I get here. But Leviticus, Leviticus 26 and 11 and 12 says, I will live among you and I will not despise you. I will walk among you and I will be your God and you will be, be with my people. God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. 
Today we walk with God. Today we walk with God. In Revelation, at the end of the age, in the heaven and the new earth, God walks with us. It's beautiful. He walks with us. He walks with us. There was a couple of pictures that we took in uh, California when the family and I, me and Angela, the two boys were walking along the coast and we were a family. We were together. One day God will walk with us physically. How beautiful is that? Ezekiel 37 says, I will make my home among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Revelation 21. (coughs) Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the old earth had disappeared And the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God. Coming down from where? From God. Out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. Maybe a poor answer. But let me get, where where is heaven where God is? Where is heaven where God is? Where isn't heaven where God isn't? If God is not there, you can have all of the festivities of glory. You can have the walls of Jasper and the pearly gates and the angelic beings, but if He's not there, it's not going to be heaven. God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Some of you have cried a lot lately. You've been crying. In heaven there will be no more crying. There will be no more death. Some of you have loved ones that have died recently or are facing death. There will be no more death. There will be no more crying and there will be no pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit the blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. Hmm. Not a staff member or a representative. Have you, ever, have you ever had a meeting with somebody pretty important? Or at least you thought you had a setup for an appointment. You show up and a representative comes. That's not the case and that's a good lead in to number five. The reason heaven won't be boring is because there your appointment will be, will be with God and you will see him face to face. You won't see a picture You will see him. And not only will you see him, he will see you and you will be with him. Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. But my face has not been seen. In Matthew 5 and 8, the scripture says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see him. Do you want to see him? Do you want to see him? I do. In 1 Corinthians 13 and 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. I want to see him. Revelation 22 and 4 says, I'll summarize, they will see his face. Heaven's not going to be boring. Heaven's not going to be boring. Heaven is a place. Let me finish with this. Heaven is a place and a person. And those who don't love the person isn't going to love the place. Let me say that again. For those of you who want to go to heaven because it seems like a better option than hell, you have what we call fire insurance. That's not going to merit eternal life, my friend. A loving relationship with the Father. And so I would ask you, those that are watching, those that are in the room, are you in love with Him? Do you long to see His face? Because heaven would not be heaven. But I got a mansion there. 
And boy, I've got them thrones and I've got them crowns and I'm going to live forever. My back ain't going to hurt no more. My friends, give me perfect health. Give me a beautiful home and take away Jesus. I don't want to go. I want to be with him. Heaven is a place, but heaven is also a person. And the person who doesn't love Jesus isn't going to like that place because that place is going to be all about him. It's going to be all about him. And look, let's be honest. Unfortunately, in our culture and in our society, whether it be a church, whether it be a nation, whether it be a church, we make things about people rather than him. In heaven, it will be all about Jesus. So I would ask you, first of all, I'll greet those that are watching online. If you don't know Jesus as your King, Savior, and Lord, and the full pardon of your sins, and the forgiveness of all of your sins, I certainly aim to bring these thoughts to you, not for you to, uh, at the end of this message, to go, hooray, I can't wait to have a mansion, but I bring this to you hoping that you will say in your heart, I can't wait to see my Savior. I can't wait to see my friend. Let me pray for you. Lord, I want to thank you for those that are watching online. I pray that the message today spoke to their heart and something in them is stirring and yearning for everlasting life. There is that innate desire within us. Eternity has been set in our hearts. I pray that they would hunger and thirst after you, first and foremost. I pray blessings upon them and their family, and I pray that they have a wonderful day knowing that they've been prayed for and we love them much. We pray this in the good name of Jesus. Amen and amen.